Today we're looking at a pair of vintage cameras and eating brownies. That can't be right. What does the script say? Oh, they are the cameras. What? <laughs> the Brownie Target 620, a camera from Kodak in the 1940s. The pair of these, we'll get to the second one in a minute, was given to me by a coworker and friend. Really cool. Um, the first thing right off the bat, I found a couple different designs online for the front of this. This is apparently one of the earlier designs that they made that was in a art deco pattern. The later versions have lines down the front of it. They're all pretty cool, but this is the box camera. It released in July of 1946, and then they made it for six years. It sold for $3.50 from what I was able to find online. This box camera would produce photos that were two and a quarter by three and a quarter inches. It takes pictures this size. Apparently, that's the size. Sure, pretty interesting concept. The way that everything worked here, uh, I don't have that much experience with film for cameras, but it was certainly interesting to dive into this. Um, they used 620 film, which is not the same as 120, and I saw that warning on every website that I went to. Apparently, Kodak made 620 film as an attempt to replace the more popular 120 film. Uh, the film itself was the same size, but the spool was different. It was made of metal instead of wood, and it would have slightly different dimensions on the actual spool size. Not the thick, not the length, but the diameter. And then the end points that would connect inside the camera, we'll get to that in a minute, were different. So of course they made something different that would not be interchangeable like that. Now, 120 would not work with 620, but 620 would work with 120 cameras, apparently. In the end, 120 won out. It was the more popular option. It's what everyone was going with, and that's what they continued to make. I could buy film for this camera, and that would certainly be an interesting experience, although I would not have a way to develop it myself unless I built a darkroom. Well, that gives me an idea for the future. This is considered a medium format camera, which makes it the first medium format camera that I own. Since I found out about them, I've always wanted to play around with one, and I certainly have my eyes on a digital medium format camera that I'd like to get one day, but it is very expensive, so it is not this day. The lens inside is fixed at a 90 millimeter, so it's a telephoto, and that's kind of interesting. We'll talk about that a bit more later with the second camera. If we just look over it for the features, this is the winding knob. This is what you would wind your film roll inside the camera, which I'll take apart here in a second. Uh, this on the top, which is attached to the strap, is a lock to keep the body attached to the front of the camera. These two metal levers on the side here. This one controls your shutter, and hopefully you can see there are some metal plates moving. Let's go closer. This bottom lever here actuates the shutter. And if you go a little slow, you can see there's a spring, there's a couple sliding plates, and just for a split second, it actually opens up to expose the, to the film. Just for a second. Split second there, that's as quick as you get it. This is snapshots, this is much faster shutter speed. This is what controls that, is this top lever here. If we take this and pull it out, draw it out, bulb exposure, for as long as this is opened up, it will expose to the film inside. Pretty cool that they were able to come up with a mechanical concept for this back then. Then the lever here on the top. This controls, it's the slide controlling stop openings. It's basically your F-stop. If you push it in, you get all the light into there. If you draw it out, you get less light. I found conflicting information online, so I'm unsure about the range. Maybe it's F11 to F16 or F16 to F22. There wasn't exactly a consensus on what it was. And I'm not looking into the camera. What is the point of the face cam if you're not gonna look into the camera? These pieces of glass here and on the side here are the viewfinders, which I thought was pretty neat. I was holding them directly up to my eye in order to see through them, and I could not get a very clear image out of it, making me think something was wrong with the camera. Can you tell that I'm used to modern cameras where you look directly into the viewfinder? This box camera is meant to be held down at your waist. Maybe not that low, but you know, stomach area maybe chest high. I'm not exactly sure where you're supposed to hold it, but you're definitely not supposed to put it directly up to your face. You hold it down, and then when you are ready to take, this would be a portrait style, so if, it, if you were looking at me, you would be seeing the camera like this. If you want to do landscape, you turn it over. And then if you're looking, this is the top-down view, you're looking down into this. There are also on the back here is this little red window here for frame counting, as they called it. 
from my understanding, you would be able to see into here into the roll of film and see how many exposures you've done and how many are remaining, maybe? Or to make sure that you've got what it locked into there, maybe? Not entirely sure. As I mentioned, there's a 90 millimeter fixed focus, a telephoto. It is fixed at about eight feet away. So I don't have eight feet of distance between me and all my cameras and things. So even if I could get this to focus down through the viewfinder, you wouldn't be able to see anything in focus anyway. And then we'll just take a look inside by pulling out the winding knob and then the top here and open it up. There we go. You can see uses the Kodak 620 film. Does not take 120. It's very clear about that. And then we have the rollers. This is where the film would go in. You'd be able to put a fresh roll of film in here and then take your empty roll and put it down here and it would feed through, expose onto the camera, and then you get your exposures wrapped up into a roll of film here. Really interesting design. I'd never considered that. The closest I ever came, we did have cartridges. For the most part, my entire experience with uh, film photography would be a throwaway camera. Buy it at the store, use it until it was full, take the whole camera, give it to them, and they give you back the photos after they've developed them. That's about the closest I ever came to film photography. Uh, we did have a film camera that would take the little canisters of film, but I was never allowed to touch it because it would be expensive. So a really neat box camera. I really liked that I was able to, to get this. I mean, it was sent to me. Um, it came with some of the, it's not in some great shape, but it's pretty old. I really like this, this is cool. Uh, we've got one more to look at here. It came as a pair. The Hawkeye outfit, also a brownie Kodak camera. And yeah, this box, not in great shape, but apparently Elaine Hawthorne owned this at some point. Couldn't tell you when or where, but this is really interesting. Uh, got the whole thing here. Let's go ahead and open it up. Interesting, huh? Interesting. So another little box camera, but this time got a handle on top, made of something different. This entire body is plastic with metal bits, whereas the last one was made of, a, of that old thick cardboard that they no longer make. I actually got a manual with this, and of course it comes with a flash. Now that's cool. What did I find out about this? This was first released in 1949, and it was made until 1961 when they stopped production on them. The flash model actually came later in 1950, again until 1961. This also took the 620 film, but it would accept the 120 film spools without you having to take your 120 film and re-spool it onto a 620 spool. But it made images that were slightly smaller, two and a quarter by two and a quarter, which is interesting to me because the film was the same size, but it made a smaller image. I don't know how that worked, but I don't have very much experience with film cameras, certainly not ones that are very, very old. You got more exposures per roll, so I guess that makes sense. 12 instead of the eight from the previous box camera. And it is more expensive. It sold for $5.50 back in the day for just the body, and then for the flash, $7. So I'm not sure how much a kit that came with both of these are, but I would have to imagine $12.50. Maybe? Similar to the previous model, it is a fixed focus. The manual says five feet, but the sources online say that there's absolutely no way that's possible and 10 feet was actually better for practical uses. A fixed aperture of f15 and a focal length of 81 millimeters. So again, another telephoto like the previous one. And for this, I actually am able to find out exactly when this was produced because of a really cool thing right here. Let's go in for a closer look. Inside the body here, you can see Yoy, 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 yo, yo, almost. This is a manufacturing code. It relates to Kodak's Camerosity, which is a thing they made up, but it's spelled C A M E R O S I T Y. Each one of those letters relates to a number one through ten. So when you translate it over, you would get 0660 or June of 1960, which was towards the end of the production. And again, a similar top spool for the new film, and then your used film would come down here and be taken out ready for developing. In my opinion, the more expensive version was a little bit simpler. You would have your shutter release here, and if you want bulb exposure, it would stay open. Hopefully you can see that it is open, as opposed to this. It also makes a different noise. 
Now, as I mentioned, both of these cameras have a telephoto lens and relatively slow shutter speed, which means that they were both susceptible to motion blur. Camera shake, when you go to take the photo, if you are not holding it perfectly still, it's going to expose and you're gonna get blur in the image. So they actually put in the manual to hold them very tightly to your body. And then something on this Hawkeye here, which is just a cool name, right? The Hawkeye, a common modification, I found this on the Wikipedia, a common modification that people would do would be to flip the lens around on the inside. It would give you a focus area of two to five feet and generate soft focus edges. Neat. So I do have the flash here, but no bulb, and it looks like it connects like this. Nope, it connects like this. And then it would screw onto here. That top one, I guess, is just for stability or maybe different camera models. I would not be surprised if they use the same flash in multiple applications, but it makes the connection, a screw holds it in place, and then you can hold it and look down through the top. There is not a way to take landscape with this, apparently, uh, and still be able to see because there is no second viewfinder. So this is a portrait only camera. And then there is still the same frame counting red window on the back for you to be able to see the film. Let's take a look at the manual here. The Hawkeye camera flash model, which it still said Hawkeye outfit on the box itself, but here's the manual. Did you know you can take color photos with this? Full color with the Coda Color Film, either in sunlight or with flash. And then they had a whole slogan with load, aim, shoot from what it looks like in here. Uh, the manual would tell you how to operate it so that you could load and then you would aim, see where she's holding it. I guess that is about waist height. And then shoot. There's your shutter control, exposure release. Very interesting. Ex instructions on how to use it. And then what kind of film you could use. Here's more information on the flash. Or I suppose that's the flash holder is what they call it with your lamp in there. How to install the batteries course it would take batteries I should open it up and make sure there are not bad batteries in there that are leaking I did not consider that it tells you how to take long exposures I actually find this really cool I bought many cameras over the years so far not so much on the vintage but newer ones and none of them I most of them don't even come with a manual anymore they come with a warranty card so they can try to get you to sign up for their services or whatever and then you know register the camera and then they'll tell you to go online and they don't they include one digitally now, if you get the close-up attachment, you can take close-up photos. Uh, this tells you how to remove the film. Let's look at some fumbles. And yeah, here's the things where there's movement and they're telling you how to do this. I actually thought this was really interesting. What if it's that the lens is obscured? The subject is out of focus. <laughs> I'm sorry, subject out of focus. This kind of fuzzy wuzzy comes up when you take pictures closer than five feet. <laughs> fuzzy wuzzy, actually in the Kodak manual. <laughs> That's great. Uh, you can also get a little case to carry it in or a filter, a cloud filter. Now, I would think this would be an N filter now, an ND filter. Um, but anyway, comes with a guarantee. Very interesting. You know, I don't know. We never had a Kodak camera from what I can remember, but I also just general information about the whole thing. I don't know what kind of cameras we did have growing up. It's something I'd like to ask my dad. I don't know the brand. I know he had a Canon at one point because the lenses were still interchangeable with some of the Canons that I had, but I don't know for sure what the other ones were because they were always referred to by their length, their focal length. That was the nomenclature that I grew up with. If he said, get the camera, he would not say, get the camera. He'd say, oh, grab the 35 because it had a 35 millimeter lens on it. I didn't realize that until just a, t a year or two ago that that was what he always called them. So. I don't know why that is. I guess because there would be a 50 at something else, but you would be able to change the lenses. Uh, the ones he had were interchangeable. It's not like they were built into it and it was a one situation. I can't really tell you why he called them that. It's something I could ask him and I don't think he'll have an answer for me either, but that's what I grew up with. That was the name of the camera, was the length that he had, 35 millimeter. Or was it the film? Maybe it was the film. Maybe I need to do some more research before I begin talking about this. So, as I mentioned, I got this as a gift. A lovely gift from a coworker and friend as part of the, a, a you're doing a good job kind of thing. 
And it was really cool that she was able to find these, I assume, at a thrift store, something along those lines. I don't know for sure. I did not ask. It seemed a bit rude, but it made a realization. I, I had a realization. That's the perfect gift for me. I don't get gifts very often, but when my family does want to get me a gift, I own everything I want. And everything I want that I don't own is because it's too expensive and I can't afford to do that. And I most certainly can't ask them to get me, you know, a new camera lens that's thousands of dollars. That's not going to happen. A camera gift would be an amazing gift because you cannot go wrong. There is no bad camera. I'll collect duplicates. I can get old vintage cameras and they'll look really good on a shelf. And it gives me the opportunity to research a video, learn more about cameras that I have no use for, but then they can sit on a shelf. It's perfect. And I know someone who has that kind of thing where they collect nutcrackers and that's their thing. If you're gonna get them a gift, you can get them a nutcracker and there is no wrong nutcracker to get as far as I know. But this would be the similar thing. Video camera, film camera, any kind of camera, I will have an interest in it. It's exactly what I can just go, hey, you know what, from now on family, if you're gonna get me a gift for a holiday or whatever the occasion is, an old camera is a perfect gift and it's not expensive because I'm sure that you can find them online for cheap at thrift stores or your local thrift store, anything like that. It's not like they have a function unless someone is going to repair it and try to actually shoot with it, with the film. I have no intentions of doing that at this point in time. Maybe in the future I'll get bored and decide to give it a try with something. But regardless, it's perfect. It's exactly what I would want and they're gonna go on a shelf and look really cool. You can't go wrong. Win-win for everyone. And so there we have it. Really cool old box cameras from the 40s. Well, ish, 50s and 60s, especially the one that I actually was able to tell when it was made. An interesting lesson, a really cool way to see that. And it did remind me, I did an entire photography course at one point online. And one of the people that we studied was a famous photographer who I unfortunately forget her name at the moment, but she made these box cameras, uh, she, that was entirely what she did. She went out and took photos of people who were not posed for a photo, just out on the street, very unassuming, a small woman with a box camera just held down at the waist and took some really cool photographs. That was an interesting lesson and I should have looked up her name before recording this. Maybe I'll put it into the description because I don't have the time at the moment. For those reasons, the fact that it's cool, I got to research something vintage, it's gonna look nice on a shelf, and it gave me the inspiration that the perfect gift for me will always be vintage cameras. These are something that I like. <laughs>